Hello. So this is my last additional video to the um, Physics IAs uh, video series. Um, I want to show you and walk you through this document I had prepared based on uh, common mistakes and experience basically. Um, also I combined my own experience with uh, the notes from the IB physics subject report from 2019. Let's start with personal engagement. Like I said before, the personal engagement doesn't have to be a separate paragraph. Actually, uh, this is the May 19 subject report IA section. The yellow highlighted sections are uh, the do's and the orange sections you can call the don'ts. Um, so there's a note here about personal engagement. This is coming from the IB. As a negative point, um, they, they're saying some students are still willing to write a personal engagement section. Not only this is inappropriate, but it's often a signal of artificial interest. Now, when you use words like you're excited about the motion of a pendulum or being fascinated by Hooke's law of springs, but are you offered no evidence of genuine involvement? Uh, it is a coincidence that your first IA is actually uh, on the motion of a pendulum. And that's a coincidence probably because it's very common. Uh, but when you actually say you have been fascinated by springs when you were three years old, we don't really believe in that. So you need to offer some evidence of genuine involvement. You can give some examples. You can give some uses. Um, justification for choosing the question should focus on actual issues. Let's move on to exploration. Okay, going back to the subject report, at the beginning there was a note that the most successful investigations had well-defined research question, clearly identified variables with a suitable method to measure and relate them together with an appropriate and known scientific background. Now this is a generic statement, but exploration is where you show this. So a well-defined set of variables with only one independent variable. This is an IA, this is not an extended essay. So you cannot have more than one independent variable. So it's very important that you are aware that you should not branch out. You have to stick to one independent and one dependent. Obviously, academic research is expected. So an example of lack of understanding is where a student claimed that the refractive index of glass varied as the incident angle varied. I can tell you now that this statement is wrong. It's scientifically inaccurate because refractive index uh, depends on the material itself and not the, the angle a, a ray hits the glass. So that is a scientifically inaccurate statement. This kind of error would seriously bring down your grade for exploration. Okay, uh, let's go through the list for exploration, my extra notes. Making reference to literature research. Show a mathematical justification for the selection of the variables and graph. Stick to scientific facts when you make a prediction. Otherwise, you're just making a statement off the top of your head that anyone can make. Put the control variables on a table. The table should have uh, headings of the variable, uh, how to control, like values or tools of, of managing the control of that, the value of the variable, and uh, a last column where you explain the rationale for the need to control that variable, which should be very clear in terms of the exact impact on the dependent variable. You should avoid statements like, if I increase the temperature, that affects my dependent variable. Affects how? If you increase this, does it increase your dependent variable or does it decrease the dependent variable? And why? People, tools are not variables. Uh, specifications of tools, or, uh, reaction time of a person can be listed as a control variable, uh, but not the person or the tool itself is not going to work well. Okay, gather materials is not a step of the procedure. Now, <laughs> I've always said this to my students before, but I'm going to find this on the official IB subject report because I, I love this. Under the expectation of a clear and concise procedure, students often wasted space by mentioning basic aspects like 
collecting and setting up the equipment, turning on a computer, and cookbook step-by-step -step instructions. A good individual investigation does not need such moronic details. Moronic details. I'm not going to add anything. Next item. A lot of people uh, fall into this trap. Uh, you list your uh, steps of carrying out the experiment and the data collection. It's well listed, well detailed, but at the end they miss to include the final step where they explain what will be done with the data. Potential weaknesses at the end of exploration are things that you expect before you collect the data. This can be brief, uh, but it should be there. It shows awareness of what you expect while you're conducting your experiment. That brings us to analysis. Going back to the IB document, presenting the result in a way that appreciates errors and uncertainties. I've had questions about how important errors and uncertainties and propagation, significant figures are important. They are a pretty big deal. Um, so you need to be consistent in your report when you stick to your significant figures when you go from raw data to process data and your final result should all be consistent in terms of significance. Here's a note from the IV report. Samples of simple calculations are not required. So you might be thinking how simple is too simple. Uh, things like maybe showing the average. If that's the only processing you're doing in a, in a lab report, which would probably mean it's too simple anyway. Uh, if it's the only kind of processing you're doing, then yes, show it. But you'll probably be doing a lot of processing with your raw data before you put it in a graph anyway. So showing how you calculate average is too basic. Or maybe even a conversion from meter to centimeter can actually be too basic. So you, that's the kind of detail you don't have to include, especially when you struggle with the page count. IB defines the acceptable page count to be between 6 to 12 pages. So if you need to save some space, this is the kind of calculation you can avoid. The majority of students constructed minimum and maximum gradients used only the extremes and the first and last data point error bars. Now, um, when we first learned how to do maximum minimum lines, I show how to do it manually. So um, it's not necessarily um, the tip of the first and the last error bars to find the maximum and minimum gradients, but you should find the path that follows from passing through your uh, er error bars, uh, as many of them as possible. Uh, it, there might be outliers you can omit while finding the uh, drawing the maximum minimum lines and that's fine. Uh, it should make sense and not stick to specific rules like, oh, it has to go from the first one and the last one. No, no, no. There's not one way. This is where you can be flexible and creative as long as you justify and make sense. Um, often students confuse the terms linear and proportional. I have a separate document summarizing this. Um, let me show you. Right, here's a little snapshot of, of different versions of, of, of uh, proportionality that you might be dealing with in your uh, DP physics uh, IAs. Um, when you claim two variables are directly proportional, that's when the, it, the two variables y and x follow y equals mx relationship. And obviously for that the, the graph would look like that. This has zero intercept, obviously there's no C term, so this graph has a zero intercept. Um, and an example of this would be weight versus mass. Obviously you expect to measure zero weight when you're not, you don't have a mass attached to your spring scale. So that could be one example. This is the only kind you can expect direct proportionality. Um, if you have y equals mx plus c, uh, which is still a linear trend, but with a significant intercept. We don't call that directly proportional. We name that linear. Uh, an example is Hooke's law with systematic error. So if you attach a uh, no mass on the spring, uh, but the spring is still um, 
showing some difference from its original um, equilibrium point. That means it's probably deformed and it's showing systematic error. That extra extension will be included in every ex every measurement you make after that point. So if it's repeating in every measurement equally, we call that systematic error, and this could be how it looks. Um, if you're measuring height versus time of freefall, uh, you have learned in mechanics unit that this is a quadratic relationship. Um, so you don't expect a linear graph if you plot height versus time. Um, if you do plot height versus time, you should get this parabolic trend, which follows the y equals x squared trend, and this is what it would look like. You would remember this shape uh, from your mechanics units, from your motion graphs. Um, if this is the kind of in, um, research, the investigation that you're doing, in physics, we would like to see linearization of your data. For example, like I explained in the previous videos, the how to process the spring oscillation lab, um, that is a relationship of, of, again, a quadratic relationship. So um, the time period and, and mass are not directly proportional. So what did we do? Mass, we rearranged the um, formula and we looked at how they are proportional to each other, we, and we found mathematically that mass is proportional to square of the time period. So just like height versus time of free fall, uh, if it's a quadratic relationship, instead of plotting height versus time, if you know height is proportional to time squared, then you plot height versus time squared, and that's what you expect to see, a linear trend. So if y is proportional to x squared, and you plot y versus x, mathematically, this is what you would get. To linearize this, you process the x variable. You calculate x squared values. So your process data would be y and x squared values. And obviously, that should be a direct proportionality. So if this is the research you're, you're conducting and you find in your uh, background research that there's a quadratic relationship, uh, y is proportional to x squared, you choose to process the x, date, x values to square them, plot y versus x squared, and that's when it would look like that. Now, I want to pause here a, little, a moment and just to show you one thing. All of these four examples I just showed you um, follow an increase-increase pattern. You can argue in each one of these four that if I increase the x variable, I increase the y variable. But you can see they're not the same at all. So this is why it's not sufficient to say in your prediction uh, if I increase the x variable, I predict that it, that will increase the y variable. Well, then I'm going to say, okay, increase how? Do you expect a linear trend? Direct proportional? Do you expect a quadratic relationship? Do you expect a square root, which is just another form of quadratic relationship, really? So what do you really expect? That's the kind of um, specific prediction you should be able to do in deep. Um, I have three more examples here. I analyzed these and these three actually uh, are examples where if you increase the x variable, you are decreasing the y variable. Again here, you're increasing the x variable that decreases the y value. Uh, as x increases, the y decreases. Uh, and same here, but they're all different. This is y equals 1 over x pattern, which we call inversely proportional. That's what inverse proportionality is. Put it in your calculator um, if you want to try it yourself. Uh, and But you, really, at this point in DP physics, you should have the mathematical skills to not have to check it on your calculator.
um, if you have a trend line like this, this is not the inversely proportional. A very, very, very common mistake. If the data follows a linear pattern, that is not the inversely proportional. That's not what we call inverse proportionality. This is inverse proportionality. This is negative linear trend. The equation of the line would look like this, and the equation of the line would look like this in here. So there's a distinction. Please be mathematically accurate when you um, interpret your graphs. It can also be an exponential decay. Uh, this is an example we will come across when we discuss radioactivity. Okay, going back to this document, what does the IB say about um, the analysis section? You can actually pause the video and read this for yourself. Just a reminder that the yellow highlights are the do's, the orange highlights are the don'ts. In evaluation, uh, I have made some statements here as reminders. I have mentioned the first one already. Um, it is good practice to present the evaluation in a table. This is not a must, but it helps the eye. And uh, personally, I happen to like tables. They're more clear, easy for me to read. Um, so limitation or error or strength on one column. Effect on data, specific impact on the data in one column. And relevant suggestions for improvement in the other column. If you make a table like this, that's going to make it easy for everyone to understand your thinking process. Um, at the end of the, of the report, you should suggest a scientifically interesting and realistic extension. This is what, where you say, as a follow-up to this ex investigation, uh, one can also conduct da -da 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 experiment as a future aspiration. So procedural limitations, methodological limitations, are different um, and please very common mistake don't forget to discuss strengths strengths are what made your data uh, reliable and the last one is the com communication criteria this is the presentation you have to cite all diagrams equations uh, used from other sources if you find an image a diagram or a picture online or from a book and you decide to use it as a support for your uh, scientific discussion that is fine but you have to cite it if you didn't draw it yourself if you didn't take the picture yourself yes you have to cite everything so an annotated sketch instead of uh, that I've mentioned this before uh, if do not make a big list if they're not really used there's no number required for number of sources that should appear uh, just don't list them if you haven't made any reference throughout the report. SI units, be careful about unit notations. Use the scientific terminology accurately. Your tables, graphs, numbers, everything must be labeled correctly. Uh, 12 pages maximum, including everything, and you must have regular margins. So reducing this space, uh, you can't get away with that. That's not OK. You have to have regular margins. It needs to look professional. Uh, there's no cover page no table of contents, no appendix, and no name on the document. Uh, general recommendations for guidance. Uh, a hypothesis is not required. Uh, this can be in the form of a question, in the form of a prediction, a statement, but you don't have to have a hypothesis. Uncertainty and error bars appear under exploration, analysis, and evaluation. Again, uh, the question I have been asked before are uncertainties error analysis, propagation of errors, significant figures, important? Well, they affect exploration, analysis, and evaluation. Actually, also including the communication criteria. Um, I hope that helps. Uh, thanks for listening.